In the box office smash horror film, A Quiet Place, the premise is that monster aliens have taken over the world, or at least the United States, and they've wiped out most of humanity. These aliens are leggy and spidery, and they have big chompers like the alien in the movie Alien, if you remember that one. Big, you know, they drool, and it's really horrifying, and they move really fast, and they snap humans up just like a snack. There are only four characters in the film, the Abbott family, who have survived this apocalypse partly because they live in somewhat isolated conditions in a rural area. It looks maybe like it might be Indiana or Ohio, beautiful farm country. But mostly they've survived because they've figured out how to be really, really quiet. The alien monsters, you see, are blind and can only detect their human prey by sound. Since their daughter, Reagan, is deaf, the Abbots already know sign language, which has been a huge advantage to their survival. The father of the family, Lee, is one of those amazingly useful guys who knows how to fix and make almost anything and has even figured out how to pour bags of sand all over the property to make quiet paths for his family to walk upon so everybody goes barefoot at all times. And if you've seen the movie, you know that has one horrible consequence. And the parents have carefully painted over all of the squeaky parts on the wooden stairs in the house. As I settled into watching this movie, I couldn't help but compare the Abbots to my own family. There's one very moving line at one point where the mother whispers to the father, who are we? Who are we if we can't protect our children? This just pierced my heart, thinking about this movie as a commentary on all the threats to children that parents want to protect them from, that all of us want to protect them from, war, famine, natural disasters, sexual predators, gun violence. It hit me really hard as one of the great lines of dialogue in any movie lately. And then part of my brain was also thinking, oh wow, you know, both of my parents snore really loudly. <laughs> so I don't know that we would have had much of a chance against these monster aliens. It would have been all over in like a day or two. <laughs> the Abbots moving through their quiet, dangerous days, loving each other and managing even to take a silent grace before dinner served on big leaves of kale or some other leafy green, because dishes are noisy, they clink, represented to me the kind of people who managed to go on living beautifully and with great tenderness, even when the circumstances around them are treacherous. I thought about families surviving in Syria, or in Sarajevo, or in the ghetto of Warsaw, or in some of our own dangerous areas in America. And it occurred to me how much dignity and strength and actually salvation can be conferred to a child or any of us at any age by the simple domestic things that mothers have traditionally done to keep children clean and fed. How often have we been saved from despair and fear and a sense of spiraling crisis by a bowl of soup quietly offered. There is a beautiful silent scene in A Quiet Place, as I just described. The family is sitting at their dinner table, so civilized, where civilization all around them has collapsed completely. They are literally surrounded by monsters. But as I said, they, they share this grace what they do is they serve up the food and then they all sit in their chairs and they reach out, they simply reach out for one another and hold hands and then they put their heads down in an attitude of prayer and they hold that for a very long moment. And I got tears. I thought of that line, 
that we just heard as our opening words, that line by Kathleen McTeague that talks about how we resist the headlong tumble into the next moment by taking communion in each other's eyes. And I just, those, they, they, they put their heads down and then somehow they know when to lift their heads up and just look at each other because they're so lucky to be alive. The mother figure in this film was, as is often the case in Hollywood movies, a little too perfect and patient and beautiful and heroic to resemble many real mothers. And while she moved quietly around taking care of her family in the midst of this terrifying situation, she always looked immaculately clean. I noticed that. Like, cleaned and ironed, in fact, with beautiful cotton clothes and all her whites were super white. No running water, mind you, and no washing machines. It seemed so unrealistic, but then I thought about the many women across the globe who are carefully washing clothes by hand, down at the river, or in a plastic bucket, or another vessel, because their washing machines either aren't working or they have never owned one in the first place. Like Evelyn Abbott, their efforts to maintain a clean home and clean bodies for themselves and their families are actually an act of radical courage and spiritual resiliency. Lethal monsters with dripping jaws and shark-like teeth may be lurching around my cornfields, but I'm gonna wake up in the morning even so and see to it that my kids are clean. From An Ode for Ironing by Pablo Neruda. The hands make the world every day. Fire unites with steel, linen, canvas, and calico come back from combat in the laundry. And from the light, a dove is born. Purity comes back from the soap suds. In this era, when we are still trying to figure out whose job it is to get the laundry done and put away, that's always my, my hardship somehow. I just can't put it away and the dishes washed, and the dinner cooked, if it gets cooked at all, or sometimes picked up from Jan's Chinese down on, down in Swampscott, or popped in the microwave, we are still beholden to the fantasy, if not the reality, of a mother at home who daily remakes the world by folding towels just so, and tucking us into a bed with fresh sheets, putting out the dish of kibble for the cat. That is enough to ask for those simple things and to hope for on many days and sometimes for a whole season. Not the big ambitions, not the huge projects, but a return to appreciation of the saving, life-giving beauty of what has traditionally been called woman's work, but that we now understand to be the work we all do to make the world new through soap suds. For those who feel irritated and oppressed by these everyday tasks, the folding of the sheets, I still cannot figure out how to fold a fitted sheet, the scrubbing of goo off the toothbrush handle, may I suggest an exercise in inverse consciousness. Put the setting of the table and the vacuuming out of the car at the top of your list of goals, of the top of your list of what you regard as a supreme accomplishment. Remember how much order, harmony, stability we create when we attend with care to a few small things. I remember my baba, my grandmother, making pirahis by hand, the dough, the potato filling, the folding, the crimping, then she sauteed them in butter. And that's partly why I look like this. <laughs> Lots of good pirahis. She served those pirahis up after hours and hours of labor in the kitchen, and her grandchildren devoured them by the dozens. A work of art, her work of art and culinary tradition handed down through generations of babas 
and served up only to be destroyed and demolished in thoughtless minutes. We were the alien monsters, throwing her work into our mouths and chewing them with our big chompers. Every woman who has assembled recipes all year, shopped for weeks, and spent days cooking for Thanksgiving meal knows the feeling of watching her hours of labor annihilated in minutes by the happy crowd around her table. These meals, again, cooked by mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, friends, these meals leave no monuments, no markers, but they create a sense of life as abundant and good and rich and tasty and pleasurable. And these things please God. These are happy destructions that in some way we hope and pray when we make them, when we offer them up, may counterweight the capriciousness of fate. Every sandwich tucked into a paper bag for a child's lunch, however hastily assembled, must carry with it a blessing. May this sandwich feed you, my child, my love. May this sandwich see you through your day. May no harm come to you. May you never sit alone and unhappy in the cafeteria. Do you see why it matters then that you put your spirit in a place of mindfulness when you slap that peanut butter onto that bread or if your child has a peanut allergy, you put that chicken salad or whatever it is onto that bread. May no peanut come near you, my allergic little darling. God keep you safe and well. These are the prayers that are unconsciously transmitted through you, through your hands and the knife that cuts off the crusts when you prepare that lunch or the simplest snack. About 10 minutes into a quiet place, we see the mother, Evelyn, in a full shot that reveals that she is pregnant. It is about a year into the alien invasion, the apocalypse, and dear God, she and Lee are going to have a baby in the midst of this incredibly dangerous situation. The audience, seeing this, groans. We already love this family, and we are thinking, oh my God, a baby? How are you gonna keep a baby quiet? How is she gonna give birth in silence? Are you kidding me? You're just creating another alien snack. <laughs> but then you realize, ah, in addition to being a great plot twist, this is a metaphor. Evelyn and Lee Abbott are people who love. And love is always life generating. Love must express itself in acts of life giving and life making, whether that is expressed through making a baby or making a bed or setting out candles and a cloth on a, an altar table, washing dishes in a kitchen after people have gathered in fellowship Oh, you root for that baby. Oh, you root for that mother bringing forth life in a basement bathtub, clenching her teeth onto a towel so she won't make any noise in her labor. And you realize how many times the mothers that you have known, whatever their relationship to you, whatever their gender, have given life under similarly sacrificial and quiet circumstances, never giving away their pain, just determined to protect you and to bring you into being in every way that they know how, body and soul. And so we think of them today. We think of them and their grounding in the love of God that has created us all and who knows and who knows out of how much pain. The love that is still and always creating us. L'chaim, to life, 
Here's to the life givers.